what is generosity? What does it mean for you? Giving back, giving to others. I just think being compassionate, you know, and anybody in trouble or need, try and help them as much as you can. Doing things for other people that you don't get, like, a reward for. Giving to someone or in any shape or form, not necessarily money. I think when you don't put yourself first and you give, even if you don't have much. When, when I say the word generosity or being generous, is someone who pops into your mind? I think of the key philanthropists of, of my country, you know, I think of the, the big names and the big organisations that give back. I, I guess at the sort of global level of Bill Gates, but he's got an awful lot to be generous with. Uh, I would think of my father. He pretty much stops at every person sitting down on the sidewalk and uh, either gives them food or gives them money or if he doesn't have money at this time, just plastic, just gives them a smile. Yeah, I think of religious people and, um, uh, yeah, you know, that, that sort of, that's historically where a lot of charity and generosities come from. Hello, I'm Tony Payne and welcome to The Generosity Project. Over the six parts of this project, we're going to be looking at what generosity really is, at what motivates and increases it, at what shrivels and kills it, at what generosity looks like in different facets of our lives as God's people. But most importantly, we're not going to be just learning about generosity. We want to seek to become more radically generous people in our families, in our communities, in our churches and in the world. And to do all this, we're going to hear from some leading Bible teachers on the subject. We're going to hear the stories of people who've grappled with what it means to be generous. We're going to reflect on all this. And of course, we're going to dig into God's life-giving word, the Bible. On one occasion, an expert in the law stood up to test Jesus and asked him what he must do to inherit eternal life. In response, Jesus says, you know the law, love God, love your neighbour. And then the teacher asks, but who is my neighbour? And in response, Jesus tells perhaps his best known parable, the parable of the Good Samaritan. Jesus' parable provides us with a perfect picture of generosity. Unlike the religious leaders who pass by on the other side of the road, the Samaritan stops to care for the man, and he does so lavishly. He gives generously to the man, much more than he was expected to give, and certainly more than he was obliged to give. We recognise the beauty and goodness of generosity when we see it, but we often find it very difficult to practise. And the things that hinder us from generosity are in themselves often very good and proper priorities. In 1973, in a famous social psychology experiment, some theological college students were told that they needed to go to another campus building to deliver a talk on the parable of the Good Samaritan. Some of the students were told that they were running late and their audience was already waiting for them. On their way to deliver their talks, the students came upon an actor who was slumped in a thoroughfare, moaning, pretending to be in distress. Only 53% of the students who were about to give a talk about the Good Samaritan stopped to help. The variable that had the most effect on whether they stopped was how much time pressure they thought they were under to get to where they had to deliver their talk. The experiment reminds us that it's easier to talk about being a good Samaritan than to be one. Because generosity is challenging. It's difficult at the level of its details. Where and when and how can and should I be generous? Those things challenge us, of course. But it's challenging at a deeper level because it challenges our hearts. 
I think there are a number of barriers that people have towards uh, generosity. I think one issue in our culture is that many people don't actually feel very wealthy. So life feels pressured. Um, they're obviously trying to pay their mortgage, pay their cars, care for their children, care for their families. And although in objective terms, in the light of history and in the world as it is today, actually they're remarkably wealthy. I think as a culture, many people simply don't feel wealthy. And therefore that causes them not to think that they've perhaps got much that they could um, give. So I think that's a major issue for many Christians is whether they've really grasped how wealthy they are and how blessed um, they've been. Maybe that's bound up with many with uh, worries about insecurity and whether they have enough to truly be um, uh, secure. I suppose there's the, uh, there's the perceived barriers and then there's possibly the, uh, the hidden barriers. So no one has ever come up to me and said, Tim, I'm really struggling with greed and that's why I can't be generous. Uh, I suppose that doesn't really surprise me though because uh, Jesus says, uh, be on your guard against greed. And so I think greed sort of has a tendency to creep up beside, behind us and grab us without us even realizing. So I think possibly greed is actually a major barrier to generosity, but many of us aren't aware of it. So uh, some of the ones that people actually articulate to me are more often, well, I just can't afford it. Uh, you know, I'm a student, so I'm not earning any money or I work part time or uh, I'm a new grad or I'm paying off a mortgage. And so I just can't afford to be generous. That's my main obstacle. For all of us who've been involved in designing and writing and producing the Generosity Project, our prayer is that God's people will not only come to grasp more profoundly His incredible generosity to us in the Lord Jesus Christ and the Gospel, but that that knowledge will transform the hearts of God's people to live radically generous lives. <laughs>